All right, guys, welcome to our next session. Um, we've got a great lineup here. We're going to be talking about the perineal tendons, those, those rascally tendons on the outside of the ankle that can cause so much problems. Eric Giza will be our moderator for tonight. Eric's a dear friend uh, out at UC Davis. And uh, Alifair Biosciences has been our generous sponsor for this session. Thanks, and uh, take it away, Eric. All right, well, thank you. And uh, share screen here. And uh, I want to thank everybody who's staying up late from around, around the globe uh, for coming into this session. Um, <clears throat> my name is Eric Giza. I'm uh, at UC Davis, which is in Sacramento, California. Um, I do want to thank Dr. Preck, as, as he said, a dear friend, a family friend. Um, we've had many great uh, travels and, and academic pursuits together, and I hope they continue. Thanks for setting this up. And uh, I do want to recognize Alifair. They, you'll see with these perineals tonight, um, there is a, they have a, a hydrogel implant that um, decreases scarring around tendons. Um, and it's now, it now has <clears throat> um, approval for neurovascular um, uh, overlay. And we are currently in an IRB approved clinical um, trial with, with this. So um, that's something to, to keep in mind for the future. Um, tonight, we're, we're so lucky to have such a great group, the STEAM panel. Really, they need no introductions. My good friend, Manuel Pellegrini um, from Santiago, Chile at Clinica de los Andes. Um, he's gonna talk about primary tears. Um, Dr. James Calder, um, we're so lucky to have, uh, who's, who's bla trailblazed the way on, on uh, posterior uh, ankle impingement endoscopy, talking about acute dislocations. Um, Dr. Brian Siginski, who was a non-Boras fellow and is, is now working in uh, Ohio, USA, uh, a rising star, going to talk about chronic dislocations. And then my partner, <clears throat> Dr. Christopher Krulin, um, who's going to talk about allograft repair. So uh, I'm going to unshare my screen. And then we will have stop share. And then Manuel will take it away. Thank you, Eric. Do you see my screen? So thank you, Eric. Thank you, Celine. It's been a back. It's been a while since I, I was trained uh, by you at Duke. That was my last day at surgery uh, in, during my fellowship. So what do we know about uh, primary tears of the perineal tendons? Uh, we know that uh, they seem to be rare injuries, but more, more than rare, uh, it's, uh, they are more frequently underdiagnosed. And the other thing that we know is the available evidence is weak. Mostly, uh, uh, it's uh, based on case series, expert opinions, and case reports. So this is a typical example. We have a 40-year-old ma male. Uh, he was a former rugby player. Uh, he presents with the right ankle pain, with retromalleal or pain, and uh, ankle instability. There's nothing weird in these uh, x-rays. Uh, you can tell that this patient have, has um, a cavus foot. And uh, he has a slight uh, various, we're looking to the right ankle. So uh, he also has a, um, a various hind foot. And this is his uh, MRI and where you can tell that uh, in the retromalleal or sulcus, you see that the uh, perineus brevis is uh, uh, flattened. And you can tell that the perineus longus is uh, just getting into it. And then you're suspecting that this patient will present with a um, perine primary perineal tendon tear. So how do we work up this strategy? So first of all, we, have a, we, we need to rule out a space conflict. Uh, Low-lying muscular bellies or perineal squartus can produce some problems in here. Instability, the ankle instability, perineal tendons instability or malalignment can contribute um, to this problem. And we also need to be aware that the MRI can be um, can can uh, induce some errors and misjudge 
the tear type that you're seeing that you may find a tear that it's more uh, extensive that you can tell and you need to be prepared to deal uh, with this primary tear or maybe uh, a uh, reconstruction that Chris is going to talk later on. And we know that the muscular belly that they are low, they're, uh, they produce uh, and they are related to these uh, primary tears. And this is what you see in the OR when you can tell that this muscular belly is getting far away uh, low than it, that it should. How do we treat these patients? So obviously we'll, we'll try non-operative treatment first, and, but most of them uh, probably will end up having some type of surgery. Redfern and Meyerson uh, described this algorithm a, lot, uh, a few years ago, but we're going to focus on the just the primary tears where most of the tendons are grossly intact. And typically, we're suggested to excise the, um, the tear and then tubular, tubularize the remaining tendon. And this is, uh, this is just one case where you can tell this that this type of tear and then what at least I do, you need to choose which uh, part of the tendon you're gonna you're, you're gonna leave intact, and it, this is gonna be a clinical judgment uh, because it's not the same that this lesion. So obviously, one patient has this this type of problem, and then you can face lesions like this. And choosing which uh, part to leave uh, is probably more difficult in cases like this, like in cases like that. But the thing that we do not do is like, uh, we don't tubularize the tendon. We just leave the remaining part in, uh, intact. And this is because some biomechanical support that our Chilean partners, Emilio Wagner, that they showed that you can leave almost 30% of the tendon uh, intact and they should be uh, able to withstand the uh, forces that they are subjected at least in this cadaveric mode. So to take home the size matters, uh, save, the, save the tendon. The 50% rule uh, has been recently challenged to be 30%. I am not sure, and, and at least I, I don't do this. I don't tubularize the tendon. Uh, uh, perineal tendons, they are flat. And I don't like the idea of adding some suture that can produce uh, some impingement or, or local problems. So I just leave the remaining healthy tendon, tendon intact as long as you have 30% of the tendon. And I always rule out the, uh, some space conflict, rule out instability or malalignment. Thank you. Oh man, well, that was, that was fantastic. And we appreciate it. It's very hard to summarize all that in, in, in just a couple of minutes. Um, maybe just a quick, before we move on to the next lecture, a, a quick survey of the panel. How many people still will tubularize? I mean, it's, I almost feel like that was all part of our sports training where you had to, if something was torn, you had to suddenly make it round, even though Manuel's completely right. It isn't round. So, so, uh, so Dr. Calder, uh, what, what do you do with those side to side? Are you yeah, no, I, I agree. I entirely agree. I mean, it's a flat tendon, brevis is flat to begin with. Why tubularize it? You're going to create a problem, I think. And I think you're absolutely right that about a third of the tendon you can just leave that and it and it seems to reform if you do serial ultrasounds later on uh it some it somehow seems to reform i, I do kind of tubularize the longus if you get a tear in that because i haven't got a problem it, it it kind of started off round and i kind of kind of make it round but i get your point uh, manuel then you're putting some suture material in there and you wonder whether that's going to create a little bit of scarring if you're not careful um but yep i i leave it normally with a brevis i just excise it and, and leave it. Brian, what were they doing? What was Vora doing in Chicago? And what are you doing now that you're 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 out on your own? So tubular eyes with a uh, 4 PDS typically. Um, if it's a peripheral tear, uh, just typically ellipse the uh, uh, portion that's uh, tendonotic and then the remaining tendon tubular eyes. All right, and Dr. Krulin, what what about you? You're, you're my you're my work spouse, so I know exactly what you're going to say. But we need to have everybody else here. <laughs> yeah, I've I, I used to tubularize per my sports training, and now I, I just leave them flat. A um, little less work, get in and out, less less insult to the area. Okay, so uh, question, Eric, has come up from the crowd. Um, how many of you go ahead and will correct a rear foot varus deformity when you do? 
the perineal repair in the setting of a canis foot? I, I, I will, if it's a chronic tear or, or you know, something like Manuel's describing, it sometimes depends on the, on the person. So if you're talking about a 50 year old person with some instability and their tendon wore out, I, I would do it. Uh, and, and we can ask James because he sees more of this than I do um, and Manuel does as well. Would you do it in a, in a 25 year old professional Premier League footballer? Um, yeah, you know the answer here, Eric, because we've, we've spoken about it before. And I think um, <clears throat> you're a very brave person to uh, correct a hind foot varus because they, they, they start off that way, they're far mechanically advantaged by it, and they'll hate you, absolutely hate you when you, when you do your osteopathy. Now, I agree, if you've got a chronic instability and you've got a recurrent problem with the, with the, um, with the perineals, and I've had that where I've, I've, I've done a repair or, or whatever, then they've come back again, they've got a, a recurrent, pair, uh, a recurrent um, problem or an instability, then I have done it. But I've warned them and I've warned their agent, do not go looking for a, a new job for a, about a year because you, you're not going to like me very much. <laughs> and then one other quick question. When you do a debridement of the tendon and you have about 30% left, what do you do to reduce the stress riser of that resected tendon, or do you care about it at all? So I, at least I trust the, the biomechanical evidence that have, has been recently provided, uh, but, but, uh, but obviously you need to, to think about what patient you're treating. So it obviously it's different to treat an athlete, to treat a 60 year old person that uh, it's moving away from any sport. So you need to take that into consideration. It's just the 30% the or 50% rule is just an, uh, one thing to consider. I, I think you need to, to, to consider your, your, your patients in, in, in perspective. All great questions um, <clears throat> and, and, and some varied answers, but I, again, it's patient specific. So I guess then if, if that's a good uh, leap off point to, uh, to ask Dr. Calder to, to move on to the chronic situation. Uh, well, I was going to talk about the uh, dislocation tendons. Yeah, um, dislocating. Okay. If that's okay with you, <laughs> that's, been, that's oh, much sure, better. Because I was the guy who asked you to do that, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Be consistent. Uh, at least you haven't made the mistake of having a bald head and a light shining above you this morning. So uh, there we go. Um, uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. This basically, this is uh, we based this on a, a, a an SKAFAS um, parallel consensus meeting which I held. Uh, in London over uh, as an excuse to go for so about 25 of us to go to the FA Cup final together from around the world um, and uh, it was obviously a very important scientific meeting as well as just a football match. Um, this basically the clinical diagnosis we know there's the popping sensation and the apprehension um, and you may get the uh, the flake fracture I'd like to discuss that later maybe because I see that pretty rarely actually I think that's a pretty unusual but by and large we look at it and we find the uh, the, the MRI scan is the definitive uh, shows where the definitive problem is with a uh, rupture of the perineal retinaculum. Um, you can treat them conservatively. Um, one, someone can, uh, but it's it's not advisable in the uh, uh, in the athlete. I mean, you they they tend to fail. I tend to f uh, uh, fix them all unless they are uh, not fit enough for a haircut, perhaps less let alone an anaesthetic. There are various different types of um, repair, operative repair, um, the rerouting of perineal tendons I've never actually seen. Um, but uh, we've tried all these during my fellowship and, and postdoc, and uh, now uh, I tend to do a groove deepening. I don't do any of the other, um, any of the other procedures. I think if we look at the different uh, procedures, if we go for SPR reattachment, there are there's level four evidence right the way through, and there's only one level three study that's actually compared the different types. But I think most people nowadays would uh, avoid just doing it purely an SPR repair and, uh, and they do some sort of groove deepening, whether that's a, a direct groove deepening or indeed an indirect groove deepening. Um, I think if we look at this, we can also look at endoscopic uh, repairs. Um, so uh, Stefan Gilo uh, uh, wrote up a, a series of these and this sort of looked at um, has looked at some uh, new new views of, of putting in the 
um, putting in a suture and just repairing the superior perineal retinaculum, having roughened the edge of the, the lateral edge of the, of the fibula. Uh, and then putting the sutures through and repairing that uh, back down on there and tugging that down on there. Now in that series, he didn't do a groove deepening, um, which has caused uh, concern as to whether that's gonna be uh, become more of a problem. But what it has done is it did is sort of promote a bit more of a debate uh, in the literature about whether we should uh, do an open repair or whether we could actually do this uh, endoscopically. And I've been very much somebody who's done open repairs but what has been uh, developed is that actually there is a fair bit of evidence to suggest that actually endoscopic repair using a groove deepening alone could actually work. Now, I disagreed with this vehemently at the, at the, uh, the, uh, um, at the meeting, um, but this is now kind of what I do. Um, so we're putting it up there as a, as, a, as a, you can do this. You can see that I've got a needle there to get the perineal tendons out of the way and do a groove deepening. And if you really roughen the outer border, the lateral border of the fibula, that sticks back down again, and the tendons will sit stick it will sit in the uh, in in the uh, in the groove that you've made, and that just repairs on its own. Now I didn't believe that was going to happen, but then I tried it. Uh, people like uh, uh, John Kennedy told me I was uh, I was I was behind the curve, and actually you know what I think that does work now. So if we take a um, the, there are reasons that I wouldn't use this though, so I wouldn't do an endoscopic repair. In um, or an endoscopic groove deepening in somebody who's got a more uh, and there's any delay in the diagnosis, or uh, there's a split in the peroneus brevis. And so in this case here, you can see that when you get the MRI scan, sure you're getting the dislocation around the corner there, but it's split in the peroneus brevis. And I tend not to deal with that to endoscopically. I will uh, I'll treat that in a professional footballer by doing uh, an open uh, an open repair with a groove deepening in this way here and take the saw and I, I tend to do a, uh, a lift uh, and then take out the, uh, the bone from underneath that to create a groove and then tamp the, um, uh, that little flap back down again and put a suture through that to uh, create an edge and then put a little bit of bone wax in the edge there. Um, now actually what we've done from that after that, after we've done that, is, uh, is repair the superior perineal retinaculum and do any, obviously, surgery to the perineus uh, brevis if that's got a split in it, and snug that up there on the inside. Having said that, I actually now have stopped using the, uh, the, the, that lift, um, lifting up the flap there, and I now just use a, a burr and burr a, a groove in the back there. I was worried as to whether that was going to leave a load of really hard debris in the back there. But so far, and I'm doing this in the, in, the, in the Premier League footballers as well, actually, I'm wrong again. It's the second time in this meeting I was wrong saying you, should, you can't make a groove with a bird that's going to make up all rough and stuff. Calder, the arrogant one, was wrong again. And actually, it does work. And I should believe my colleagues who have done it a lot more times than I have. And you can use a burr, create a thing, and it just, and I don't put any bone wax in there, I don't want anything else, and it just creates a new surface as long as you get them moving. And with that technique, I think you can get them moving um, as long as the wound's okay uh, within a week. So in summary, I think endoscopic does work. You can use that in the acute situation without tears. And I'd use an, an open technique uh, in the subacute with tears and I'm now burr of uh, a groove deepening. Thank you very much. Thanks James, that, that, was, that was fantastic. Um, <clears throat> especially with your wealth of experience in doing this in, in professional athletes, which is, you know, uh, <clears throat> kind of sets the standard for a lot of things that we do. Um, I would say it, this is why I, I kind of set it up this way, because as a guy who did a sports fellowship and used to do a lot of shoulder, we would never groove deep in the glenoid. We would just fix the bank heart. So I'm a big SPR guy and we can we can get into it during the discussion. But But I agree with you that particularly if if you're going to go about it without a big open procedure. Um, the, the other thing that I think is kind of fun and uh, is that if the, uh, you know, the plastic surgeons do a lift and talk all the time, but they get to charge cash only <laughs> and we're subject to, to, at least in the United States, we're subject to our American uh, 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 insurance company. So, you know, that, that's really cutting edge and, and certainly, um, 
Masato Takao uh, as well ha has published um, a similar series, um, but also would, would actually tighten down the SPR. Um, for our viewers, uh, when you were that, that, uh, that tendoscopic view, when you were doing the shaving with that wire that was in there, can you just kind of tell everybody what, you know, what that's for? Yeah, that's, um, that's basically using the, uh, using the needle to try and lift the perineal tendons out of the way. And then you put a needle through to hold them out of the way. So like a sort of a, a, a pole to, to keep the tendons out of the, out of the way. So you're not going to go into damage them at all. Just creates a bit more space um, in, in that area. Cause otherwise they just kind of get it. They get chewed up. <laughs> right, they, they, they fall over. Shit. And and the the one or two that Chris Quillen and I have done um, together, we we use that same thing. We use a small K wire, just pull the tendons back and get them out of the way. It gives you a little bit more visualization. Yeah. So well, it's interesting, so, Eric. You know, I think that the, 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 I I used to just use a perineal super SPL repair, but kind of there's a reason that it that they dislocated in the first place. They're pretty rare. But I, and that's why I think philosophically, I think that we do, I do groove deepen or an, and, or I will remove it, say an accessory, uh, you know, quarters or whatever there is in there as well at the same time to give it more space. space so up. in the setting of, uh, there's a question in the setting of a uh, tear, whether it's chronic or acute, if the tissue is not that great for your repair or debridement, is there any role for biologic grafts? And if so, what are the, what options do you guys prefer? Um, we may come on to that more with perhaps with the chronics, but um, I I don't use anything um, that doesn't that didn't start off in the in the body to begin with in around the perineals. So if I um, uh, if I need to, I'll either do a, a, a long bust of brevis uh, side to side, or I'll take a hamstring and I'll uh, use a hamstring. Uh, I've used, um, you know, these are rare cases where your SPR is kind of just completely gone um, or revision cases where it's all just scarred down on top of it. Um, <clears throat> I've used just a strip of, you know, any type of allograft that's available the, or perineal tendon, if you will. Um, Krulin, I don't know if, have you ever used uh, something to, 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 to redo the SPR? I've used primarily allograft just for the ease of access, uh, not having to go. If I, I think if I had to use autograph, even fascia a lot, I don't like taking hamstrings, but um, for for what for what we have, it's typically just that, um, to use, and that does a trick. But once again, that's rare. Most of the time, there's tissue there that you can close down, and you can always groove and do a little and that decreases how much of that SPR you actually need. Uh, and uh, Brian, anything that you've seen, any any anything new there in the Midwest in Ohio that, that that's happening? Um, yeah, I mean for chronic tears, I tend to uh, just do like a tenodesis. Um, but you know, in a young patient, we consider an allograft if it's acute. Um, for more chronic settings, uh, you know, and consider a uh, like an FHL transfer. Um, you know, if uh, the you know, muscle belly is not viable. But um, tend to stay away from anything allograft unless it's absolutely necessary, like a younger patient where there's a complete rupture. All right. Well, let's uh, then let's move on to the. Uh, that's it's a good segue into the the chronic the chronic setting and and Manuel and James, thanks thanks again, and we'll go on to the third. Yeah, appreciate it. So. I think there's a lot of similarities between uh, chronic and acute, maybe with the exception of group deepening, which is um, something that I personally do with my chronic cases, but uh, um, is debatable just based on their retro uh, malleolar sulcus. So I think when addressing chronic dislocation, it's probably important to identify what the underlying pathology is or what's really driving the dislocation. Um, is a chronic ankle instability, is it a cable varus? So we talked about this just previously, but here's a pre-op patient of mine that has a, uh, a varus heel, and you can see the alignment here. And this, this is post-operative now. She had a, approximately about a 50% tendon tear. So uh, when I got in there, I decided to cut the heel. I could send her for a potential calcaneal osteotomy, but I think in 
a case like this with her instability, I decided to cut the heel here. Um, you know, again, chronic ankle instability leads to tenosynovitis and then uh, subsequent attenuation of the SPR. So cases like this, obviously, you're tightening the SPR. Um, Low-lying muscle belly or the cordis tendon, as we talked about, um, all increase the retromalleolar uh, uh, pressure and lead to attenuation of the SPR and subsequent subluxation of the uh, perineal tendon. So again, it's important to uh, address all underlying pathologies. I won't belabor the anatomy here, but we all know that the SPR travels to the Achilles is one of the main branches here. So when talking about the retromalleolar sulcus, I think addressing the anatomy, uh, both the SPR and groove deepening are two uh, important uh, aspects of addressing chronic dislocation. Uh, we know that there's a fibrocartilaginous rim that uh, does provide a significant amount of depth uh, to the retromalleolar uh, sulcus, particularly as you go distal, um, the groove uh, does tend to flatten out the osseous anatomy, and so that this rim becomes particularly important. Um, here's an MRI study uh, looking at uh, the morphological variations of the uh, retromalleolar groove and uh, 39 patients with recurrent ankle instability versus 39 patients with, uh, or con with the controls. And um, if you look at the distribution of uh, morphological variations of the retromalleolar anatomy, you can see that the distributions between the dislocation group and the control group is rather uh, similar. So the conclusion is, is that there really is no correlation with more thought, morphology and dislocation, and there is no statistical difference in this particular study. Now, um, this is a patient that I had, a 48-year-old female with lateral ankle pain for a couple of years and really no significant history of instability, but uh, perineal subluxation on an exam. And so when you look at this cross-sectional anatomy here, um, initially uh, you, you appreciate a convex groove, and I'm anticipating a potential groove deepening procedure here. And obviously there's a low-lying muscle belly and then some attenuation of the SPR. When I got in there, this is what it looked like. So this is the cross-sectional anatomy here. This is axial um, and you're looking into the fibrosseous canal and you can appreciate that there's a pretty good fibrocartilaginous ridge here. Um, and so I actually did not do a groove deepening. I'll proceed with this case. But in that particular case, I think that the fibrosseous uh, or the uh, fibrocartilaginous ridge um, um, was sufficient. Um, here in this case, you can see that the tenosynovitis was pretty significant, and um, you can see the uh, cartilaginous rim is actually uh, doing a pretty good job of restraining the tendon. So um, there was a low-lying muscle belly, which was excised, and then the tear that's repaired. And um, the forceps here are pointing to the uh, fibular periosteum and SPR, and they are not detached from the fibula. So in this particular case, I did an SPR invocation and tightened it down to uh, um, the ridge there. And you can see the good contour and anatomy that restrains the tendons. I put a free underneath it as always, just to make sure they don't over tighten it. Um, here's a, a, a little bit of a different flavor where the SPR is, um, is uh, denuded from the fibula. And um, you can see that the actually a ra rather good sulcus. So uh, the concepts with the SPR repair here are that you have to restore the periosteum and SPR to the lateral fibular bone, reestablish the uh, fibrocartilaginous rim, and then um, make sure that you don't over tighten the SPR. Um, I think the difference between acute and chronic, or in really any case, you want to decorticate the fibula so that you can get the soft tissue to heal down to the bone. And then this is. Um, the technique, these are actually uh, uh, photos that Dr. Giza lent me, but uh, you can see that there's uh, anchors going into the fibula here. You get reattachment of the fibular periosteum um, and, then, uh, and then repair the SPR. It takes two limbs of the suture and then anchors into the fibula to uh, provide more of a um, uh, footprint uh, of the fibular periosteum down to the fibular bone. So here you can see the anchor going. In, and then that's what you're left with at the end here. There's a uh, illustration depicting that. So when you look at uh, uh, different groove deepening procedures, there's quite a bit in the literature, um, you know, anywhere from uh, removing bone with a drill and then tamping in uh, the retromalleolar sulcus to doing a, uh, a groove deepening with a uh, burr. Um, and uh, really it's just surgeon preference. 
I think it's important to note that you do decrease retromalleal pressure um, when you do do groove deepening. Um, and uh, the redislocation weight, whether you just do SPR and a groove deepening or just an SPR repair is uh, overall pretty low in the literature across the board. Um, and uh, return to sports may be a little bit more accelerated with groove deepening, but here's an example of a groove deepening. And again, there's many different flavors of how to deepen the groove in a chronic dislocation here, but you see it tamping down the retromalleolar sulcus and then putting some bone wax over the edges there. I think there's uh, bony procedures, a, a distal uh, fibular uh, slide, uh, rerouting procedures may be a little bit more um, historic and potentially might have a, uh, a use in revision cases, but they might be associated with a little bit higher complication rate. So I, I don't do any of these. And I haven't seen uh, any, any of these procedures, but appreciate it. Great, Brian. Thank you. And I, uh, that, that was a very good summary because, uh, you know, it, it is difficult to treat and we're, we're left with different types of pathology. None of these are the same. Like, you know, the, the easier thing by and large, especially when I did a lot more knee surgery was you tore your ACL. Sometimes, you know, I'm not going to make it too simplified, but you're doing an ACL reconstruction. Okay. You get this, that, and the other, but a lot of times with perineals, you, you kind of get in there and my residents or my fellows are like, what are we going to do? I'm like, we're going to make it up as we go, you know, and, and you got to see what tissues you have. You got to see what's torn because MRI can lie a little bit. And so, um, I don't know, I'll ask the panel, have you, have, Manuel, have you ever gone in on one where you thought this will be simple and then you're kind of una sorpresa, <laughs> surprise. Sure. Sure, it's uh, there's no uh, um, there's no easy case, so we need to be prepared to face, and that was something that was tried to point out when um, when you look into and you MRI, you, you can misjudge a, a tear, and then you find that you don't have a tendon. So uh, you need to be prepared to do um, to do a reconstruction or whatever you need. So usually something that we do is like uh, we, when we operate on, on young uh, patients, uh, we always have a allograph available there. Just in case you need it, you just uh, take it out and you reconstruct the tendon. So question from the crowd, from the audience. Do you guys see intrasheath perineal subluxation? And if you do see it, how do you address it? Um, yeah, well, I'll go. Yep, but we, I do see it, and I wasn't sure about believing it, but I, you know, I get them an ultra dynamic ultrasound scan, so I get the radiologist to show exactly what's going on to convince me that that's what's going on, and then I, if they've got an accessory tendon there, I'll endoscopically take out that accessory, that cordus, um, and uh, and I will also um, I'll do a groove deepening. I know you know Eric, you'll be going, you know, you'll be killing me by the end of this. I but never I, said I, I don't do it. it. I just said I don't do it as much as you do. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, I'll I'll take a, I'll take some I'll take the burr there and oh, the burr, I'll do it endoscopically and uh, and and do that. And it's um, so far so good. I I know I've got a a, a lady who, who who's still got clicking tendons. It doesn't hurt as much, but she tells you know she can she can she still does it, but. It's, um, yeah, that's kind of what I do. You know, James, you, you bring up a great point. I mean, I have to say before the era of, you know, tendoscopy, you kind of look at the, and ultrasound, right? So you're going back 15, 20 years, you're like, MRI looks normal. I can't see them dislocating on my exam. You s certainly must be crazy. And then maybe we'd inject them with some, some lidocaine or what have you. Um, but I think um, ultrasound has certainly helped. I, I don't do it myself, but we have a, a group of, of sports medicine physicians um, who, who, who are very skilled at it. And you can, you can actually see it. And then on tendoscopy, you can see that little kind of strangeness of the SPR, that little bit of attenuation. Um, 
that either makes us crazy or them crazy, but we're we're seeing it now. So so I, I think that's a great great question from the. I think you you bring up a point there, there Eric, that, that actually um, you know if they if they I, I want to get the radiologist to do the the, the ultrasound, but if it, if they if they've got clicking but it doesn't hurt, I tell them don't worry about it, just put up with it, just live with it, do not have it, do not have it operated on. When they're painful, I'm just a little concerned. So I get them to do an ultrasound guided injection of local anesthetic just as a diagnostic thing to make sure the pain is actually coming from that uh, from that sheath. Well, well, good. Now let's let let's go uh, from the subtle to the not so subtle anymore. Dr. Krul is going to tell us about what to do when all is lost. <laughs> Chris, unmute. There we go. Okay, here we go. All right, so I'm Chris and I'm out here in uh, Sacramento with Eric Giza. Um, we are the foot service out here and uh, it's been a good, good ride working with Eric for the past eight years. So I'm talking about allograph tendons in the use for perineal tendon repair. And when you do a literature search out there, uh, what I could find was started in about 2010 with this techniques article that uh, was done by Nunley at Duke. And then it proceeded to uh, another article by the same group. And this is where Sealand jumped in and they did a retrospective uh, analysis of 14 patients with an average of 17 months follow-up. Interesting, their average graph length was about 10 centimeters, so quite long. But what they showed was that there was a decrease in uh, the uh, BAS, their strength increased significantly, as well as improvements in their SF12 and their lower extremity function tests or scores. So from there, uh, this is when- Interrupt as the moderator is, are others seeing Dr. Krul on screen okay? No, I was just about to say. So we, we're not sure. Are you, so uh, maybe Chris, we could have some help from the tech folks just yeah. to make it work. Because uh, yeah. I can see his pointer. Um, yes. If it's it work on now? No. If it's can, on. can you uh, help us out on this? GK, are you using two screens? No. We did a test before and it worked. Are you doing full share screen? Yeah. Or just uh, just the clean side? I'm, I'm just uh, pinging the, the AV guys. And then, uh, Krohn, this is in our Dropbox, right? No, yeah. Because I so I can just pull it up on my. It would be under CK presentations. Okay. Perineals. CK presentations. It's always something. Let me see if there's any questions that can be answered in the. Yeah, we can do questions. Parent is is it parent so, um, James, do you uh, routinely do a tendoscopy on your patients who have perineal pathology, at the very least, just to be diagnostic, or are you more discriminating on using tendoscopy? No, I I I still find tendoscopy uh, difficult. So um, I tend to if I know if I know the pathology, which I hopefully will do before we go in there. If they've got a tear, uh, I will, I will go in and do a, um, and uh, do an open. Oh, there's two of me just come in there. Uh, I'll do it. I'll do an open, an open exploration. The only time I really do a, a tendoscopy is when I'm uh, going to be doing a, a, a groove deepening actually. Then the other one is if there's a, uh, as we talked about intrasheath and I want to excise uh, a low line muscle belly or a, uh, or a quartus. 
but otherwise I've tried to do these other ones where we, and maybe I'm wrong. You know, we, we talked about this earlier on where the, we do, if we've got a less than 50% uh, or less than less than 30, 60% uh, of the 10 that's gone, we could just maybe just, just excise that uh, endoscopically. And uh, a lot of my colleagues do, but I just find that quite difficult. I like, I like to get right the way around the corner there and and, and make sure we're, we're, we're in the right place. So I tend to do it overnight. I'm, I don't do always do a, a routinely do a, a tendoscopy. Chris, do you want to just keep going and then I'll see if I can get, oh, there you go. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, to, I told you we were, we were work spouses. <laughs> yes. Let's see if this works. Quillen, you tell me next. If, uh, if yes, sir. Up. Let's see. There we go. All right, keep going forward. We got to get to the Pellegrini article. There we go. All right, so, we talked about this one. Yeah, sure. so, then, so then Manuel came to the United States and had to get a few articles under his belt and talked to uh, you, Sam Adams and Sealand. They did this article where they did a case report taking a, a Tina Desis, taking it down and turning it back into 210. You see with these pictures, they take, they take down, down the Tina Desis and then the bottom, bottom picture shows two allograft tendons restoring tension of both the brevis and the longus. Then, well, Manuel was there, next slide. They also did a, a biomechanical study looking at uh, how the allograft functioned and compared it to a tenodesis. And using uh, you know, these force couplers, they saw that the allograft, go for allograft actually restored tension of the brevis and the tenodesis did not. And this table here is a good example showing the allograft has almost 100% of normal, whereas the tenodesis does not. So I thought that was interesting as well because it shows you a little biomechanical data to go along with the case reports. Next. So just a quick case example, 62 year old um, active hiker, biker, skier, actually was a, a sports doc with Eric and I, and then he retired and moved to Idaho. Shows up eight months later after a fall and he's, his ankles giving way, his exam showed no laxity on the lateral ligaments. So an MRI was done and you could see on the, on the axial cut, there obviously is some perineal pathology. And then on this T1 sagittal cut, the arrow points right to where you would normally see two black lines representing the perineal tendons and they're gone. So uh, this was a time when uh, we had been talking with Seelan and started talking about doing allografts ourselves. And so he was brought to the operating room, next slide for an allograft treatment. So opened them up, isolated out the distal stumps, the brevis and the longus. And then approximately it was this combination stump of longus and brevis, but they had basically congealed together to form one big tendon. So instead of going any higher, the determination was that it left as one proximally, and then we would then make two distally. Um, next slide. So using the ACL uh, graft grasper, you, uh, we formatted the tendon to have two on the top and two on the bottom, use some uh, looped suture to create uh, strength around each. And then this video will show, hit click it, it will show like a pulver taft technique, pulling into the uh, proximal segment. And from there, tying those down and getting that good. And then go to the next slide and you can see how well, how much tension was set there. So there they are sewn in and then the video will show the wakeboard test on the perineals. See, there's, there's, there's the wakeboard riding along. And uh, now you have your two segments to tie in. So go to the next. So here they are tied in, one to the brevis, one to the longest and uh, testing. So the lateral ligaments look good everything looks stable. And then what's left is a uh, retinacular repair. Four months later, he shows up. He's been doing rehab in Idaho. And you can see he's got really excellent range of motion. He's got eversion past neutral. He's got no real scarring, complaining about much and is very happy with how well he's doing. Next slide. And the other so thing, couple... Chris, to talk about is, is and and sealing just because you you know you you help pioneer this is look look at their muscle belly firing you know you're restoring that 
which is interesting. I know it's not perfect because you can see some atrophy in the center of it, but very interesting. <clears throat> so a, a few technique pearls that where I have changed over time. Um, here's here's a, uh, a one that I did recently where it looked like maybe it was the longest that was torn, but it was actually the brevis that had snapped and had cone behind the longest. So opens up, exposed it, and then used an allograft tendon to repair it. Set the basically put the suture sewed it together uh, approximately, and then ran a loop suture down, and then you cut the loop suture and crack out it into the distal stump with tension. And then one thing that I've started doing is then I back that repair up by taking a fiber tape and sewing that in with a Vicro and they'll get collagen ingrowth into that. So it just gives me a little more sense of strength and will allow me to be a little more aggressive in the early stages of my rehab. Uh, next slide. And then finally, what, another part is use this hyaluronic membrane uh, to wrap the tendon. Uh, it's called Versa Wrap and put that around the tendon and then next hit it again, Eric. And then use this fluid and drip it on there and it kind of melts onto the tendon. And so I put that on next before we close. And this is what we're doing the clinical trial on. And the video wouldn't work, Eric, so I just did a screenshot. Okay. Um, so next slide. So one last thing is uh, I called this the autograph swap. So some cultures or some countries can't even use allografts. So you could always use an, an autograph like a hamstring. But in this case, this, this guy had a uh, distal brevis tear that's not in this image, a proximal um, longest tear. And I did not have an allograft. And so what I did was uh, took the, prox the proximal brevis or longest portion, cut that out, Tina Dees that to the brevis, and then repaired the um, brevis, repaired the brevis distally. Because he had a cavus foot, you know, one of the techniques is always a brevis or longest to brevis transfer. So I just left his brevis or sorry, his longest alone and um, was able to repair uh, his uh, Brevis and he was doing quite well. He's been doing quite well, continuing to follow him. I think one more picture. Hit the button, Eric. Oh, it skipped it. Okay. Um, so um, I had a picture of it in there, but it disappeared. So typically, I'm trying to get more aggressive with our post-operative course, uh, non-weight bearing for two weeks or about 12 days till I see him in clinic again, and then I get him full weight bearing in a boot and start PT. Uh, starting with just dorsiflexion plantar flexion, and by four weeks, I want them to be doing eversion and inversion. Um, I really think that using physio is really what helps these patients progress along. The ones that kind of sit around at home and don't do much and don't have guidance are the ones that get stiff and don't do as well. And so the goal is to return to activity. I'd say in the non-athlete, who is a lot of whom we operate on, probably in 14 to 18 weeks. All right, and then a thank you slide. All right, then here's the keys to success. So I think tensioning the repair. So if you make it loose, you're not gonna get any reactivation of those muscle bellies. Again, like I said, physiotherapy is important. Motion promotes healing, motion repairing and stiffness. And then always know that you can use an autograph if needed. And last slide, there we go. So I got a question here. Uh, why are you guys taking out the low line muscle belly? Um, I, I think that's, that's a great question and, uh, let's, uh, let's kick that off. I just want to first thank Chris for doing that. Um, excellent presentation. Certainly those are kind of revision situations. They're not, they're not easy. Uh, it involves a lot of different things. Um, Brian, you'd mentioned the FHL transfer, which Mafuli talked about, and he's obviously, we don't want to overlook all the great research that he's done on the, the peroneal tendons. Um, I don't have much experience with the FHL transfer. Um, Ceylon, before we get into that question, which is a good one, and I, it was one of my, my case presentation ones. So uh, um, I, I don't know if anybody else has had uh, much experience with doing the, what Mafuli had described, which is the 
moving the FHL around from the other side. Brian, you had mentioned, is that something you do consistently or? Uh, no, I mean, it's something I prepared for. At a, um, I had an older gentleman, I think he was in his mid seventies, but he was a pretty active guy. And uh, he was about four months out from a brevis rupture, complete brevis rupture. Um, and just had that in as an option, um, but ended up using like an allograft. So I've uh, helped Keith Wapner write his series up of seven patients who had an FHL, and it was a two-stage procedure. Stage one, you go into an aggressive debridement, you put down a hunter rod, you close whatever you can behind it, you let them weight bears tolerate it right away. At week six, you bring them back to the OR because the tendon sheath is reformed, and you percutaneously, um, so you, you'll, you'll harvest the FHL, but then you percutaneously at the proximal end of the hunter rod, attach the FHL tendon, uh, slide the hunter rod through the distal percutaneous incision so that the tendon rides underneath that new tendon sheath, and then you pull it back out the distal end and you reattach it. And his data was five out of seven people had good to excellent results. Um, I, that's the biggest series I've ever seen. Um, I haven't had to do it in my own practice, especially because of the data from our allografts, but it's something that, especially in countries that don't have allografts, it's something that's uh, worth having available. Yeah, and, and, and Chris, thanks for bringing up the, the, the rehab portion of it. Manuel, I, I, I know you, you guys treat a lot of active patients down there in, in Santiago at the Clinica. Like how I've gone, gotten out of locking people up and, and even if I'm worried about doing inversion, eversion, I'm telling people to plantar and dorsiflex pretty much straight away so they don't scar down. What's your guys' experience? Yes, um, pretty much the same. Uh, the, the one thing that we don't do is that we don't uh, restrict weight bearing these patients. Uh, we allow them to weight bear as long as they are uh, immobilized uh, in their boot. And we encourage them to do plantar flexion as well, uh, obviously very carefully during the first six weeks. And after the six week period, we start aggressively um, uh, with your rehabilitation program. Anybody on the panel allowing just, you know, even with an allograph, channel inversion, eversion um, right away, or, you know, just active inversion, eversion, not active assisted where the physio is helping or, or passive? Um, I, I'm more worried about the wound for the first couple of weeks, so I, I, t I tend to leave them. Um, and I, I get your point, Manuel. I, 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 I won't trust my, my footballers uh, as much as, uh, unless they come from Chile. So uh, I'll, uh, I, I, I keep them immobilized for a couple of weeks, just purely for wound and, and to allow me to sleep. But I get your point. There's no need otherwise to, you can weight bear them. And I will, but I will get them moving with physiotherapists uh, at a week. So I'll get them out of, a, out of a cast and get them moving pretty quick. That's passive movement. Yeah. And, and one other question that, that came up, um, especially uh, watching Brian, some of yours with the, with the Averis hind foot, you know, with the advent of this minimally invasive surgery, certainly the, these cases I've done some revisions where I'm like, geez, the prior surgeon uh, made this incision kind of posterior, but I, I'm choosing on this patient, they may be older, to do a, a, a lateralizing calicosteotomy. And, and I've actually found this minimally invasive fantastic because you're doing this small incision and then you can open up the peroneal tendons. Um, and it, what, what's the experience uh, you know, around the world? We'll start South America and then go to the UK and then finish in the Midwest. So Manuel, you guys using the MIS ever for the, the calcaneus osteotomy? We're, we're doing it, but for the medializing, medializing one, I think it's easier the, to start with that, uh, with that one. The lateralizing, it's a, I believe it's, it's, uh, it's harder to do, it's harder to mobilize, and you need to do this correction in two planes. So you need to take a wedge and then lateralize. So I think it's, uh, it's not the one to start with. That's true. <laughs> um, Brian, any any uh, any experience with that? I I don't do the MIS particularly for a, a cavus or a varus heel because a lot of times I'm doing a closing wedge, 
And um, I think releasing the fascia to get good correction to correction to uh, is important. So um, I do, I just have two incisions and I space the uh, uh, larger anterior incision, just like a centimeter more anterior than I normally would for a typical uh, um, perineal tendon repair. And I still do a traditional open calc osteotomy because of the closing wedge. James, how about in the UK? Because I know MIS is big in Europe. I know, I know it's a little south of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, uh, but I, yeah, it, I, I don't, I don't tend to do it. I, I would, and I'd agree with both Manuel and, and Brian that trying to do a, a closing wedge lateralizing uh, is, is really difficult. Um, so uh, I, I do it, I do it open. I tend to, I'll actually just extend that long. And I'm re, I know exactly what you mean when you get that incision, you think, oh, darn it, what, what, they got that in the wrong place for me. And um, I'll extend that. I just don't like the, the, the tram lines too much. So uh, I'll extend that and I'll just get a, they'll get a big, a big cut <laughs> and I'll do it that way. Yeah, that's, that's certainly one way. I, I found that you can take it off the lateral wall if you, you know, you do it enough times. All right, see on Stelmi, three minutes left. I got, I got one thing that we didn't bring up that I think we can just quick go around the horn. I'll share my screen and then we'll be done. Um, because the, the, this is always a kind of a bit of a tough one, is who's got the experience with, with this fun one, which is the peroneus longus at the os. So I got a, a female tennis player. She's also one of the nurse managers So I, uh, on the floor, so I can't mess this up. Feels a pop and uh, has got this and says, I want to be back playing tennis. And I get in there and I, I'm looking at this. Um, to, you know, 30 seconds, 20 seconds each. What's everybody doing here? Cut out the painful bit, leave the perineus longus. Definitely don't try and repair that underneath the foot. It's uh, uh, one, you can't repair the, the os. Um, as Chris Pierce in Singapore says, if a bone's small enough to stick up your nose, don't try and repair it. <laughs> That's good advice. Krulin, you repairing this? No, I'm not repairing it. I might even dece it to the brev to the brevis. This is a tenodesis. Manuel? Yes, I think so. Uh, I I don't know. Do you have a weight bearing X ray or uh, just to? Uh, no, just I do, but it was okay. The same one. She wasn't falling. This was pretty acute, so she wasn't falling into. In the uh, it, will, it will help if she, uh, if she had a uh, cavus food, it will be easier to tino this, uh, just uh, remove the, the disease part and just tino you know, this the longest to the brevis, leave it alone. All right, that's a good point. This one, they had, I was able to find the stump. It was pretty rare, so I put an allograft and some some uh, some stuff in there, but but I would agree with everybody. The, the, those, are, those are the ones where I will we'll typically move to um, Tina Disa. So um, I, I just want to thank everybody again. Um, here's our thank you slide. Thank Seal and Parekh. Um, thank my colleagues for staying up to all odd hours, uh, which I'll be doing a little bit later tonight. And uh, wish everybody the best and, and hope that we all get to see each other in person soon. But appreciate everybody's expertise and insights. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Eric, for moderating and everybody staying up for this. Um, thanks to Alifair Biosciences for sponsoring. We'll be back in a few moments. Thanks, guys. Thank you.